Welcome back to The Breakdown with me, NLW. It's a daily podcast on macro, Bitcoin, and the big picture power shifts remaking our world. What's going on, guys? It is Friday, April 26th, and that means it's time for the Friday Five. Before we get into that, however, if you're enjoying The Breakdown, please go subscribe to it, give it a rating, give it a review, or if you want to dive deeper into the conversation, come join us on The Breakers Discord. You can find a link in the show notes or go to bit.ly slash breakdown pod. Hey, hello, friends. Quick note before we dive into today's show. You've probably heard that I've kind of been blending the Friday Five that I do with Scott Melker on Friday mornings with the weekly recap, because they're basically the same show. And so going forward, there is just going to be one of those as a sort of Friday, Saturday package. The content is almost entirely the same, and I think it just makes sense to combine them together. Still at this stage, intending to always do a long read Sunday as well, so there will be some weekend content. But that's the plan going forward. And this week, there was a lot to talk about. In some ways, the more that I think about it, the more that I'm convinced that we really are seeing Operation Chokepoint 2.0, but 2.0, where the goal of all of these agencies is no longer to destroy crypto entirely, but to basically kill self-custody in the name of KYC AML regimes. We get into all of that on the show, but it's something that I'm keeping an eye on, and I'm certain that we will talk about more in the weeks and months to come. For now, though, let's dive into the Friday Five, formerly known as the Weekly Recap. NLW, man, it has been a wild week. We kind of had some quiet times there for a while. Definitely not now. Yeah, it was a real when it rains, it pours kind of a week here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, first, as I've committed to just taking a look at the market, Bitcoin's just sideways, right? Amidst all of this nonsense, we've just been kind of trading in the middle of the 60,000s. We haven't even talked about the halving, but I think it came and went as we would have anticipated with a whole lot of much ado about nothing, sideways price action, which is sort of my expectation for quite a while here. Did you expect more from Bitcoin around the halving? No, no. I mean, anyone who's watched it, it's it's almost always, it's never a dramatic sell the news event, but nor is it a dramatic, you know, uh, things happen right after it event. So it's, it was almost invariably going to be a bunch of other stuff uh, that that was causing whatever Bitcoin price action was happening. I think the most interesting thing around the having was the sort of fee price spikes uh, leading up to it with with ordinals. I think that represented a kind of a new moment for Bitcoin. But yeah, price is never the first and primary uh, thing that happens around the having. Yeah, high transaction fees, volatility become the calling card for Bitcoin, which kind of leads to the next story and the first one of the day, which I think is exceptionally bullish and is one of those I just don't see that many people talking about. Stripe brings back crypto payments via USDC stablecoin. The payments firm stopped taking crypto payments in 2018 due to Bitcoin's high volatility. So people may remember that Stripe had attempted to adopt Bitcoin because of those uh transaction fees, which were unpredictable. They could be high, they could be low, they could be in the middle. The network being slow and the high volatility of the actual asset, they eventually got rid of it, but now adopting USDC exclusively uh, for crypto payments. So how big do you think this is? What do you make of the decision to go solely with USDC? I think it's a much bigger deal than people would think if you're not paying close attention to, or if you're not building a business that uses Stripe, if you don't notice how much Stripe is sort of, you know, everywhere. Um, When this happened in 2018, I remember there being broadly a perception that it was both motivated by exactly what they said it was motivated by, the the actual sort of volatility and and challenges of Bitcoin, but also it representing a um, a, a sort of mark as we peeled off of the the 2017 bull market, an indication that, you know, people just were, it wasn't worth the trouble, right? Even if it wasn't some big negative stamp on on Bitcoin or anything like that, it was an indication that the, you know, sort of emerging class of technology financial firms weren't that interested in in doing what it took to actually engage with this. So I think in in similar ways, this represents uh, a, a return of financial services firms saying that crypto is worth dealing with, that it's become a, a going concern enough to actually deal with whatever is going to come. You know, Stripe is a very large, I mean, they're, they're the largest private startup, I think, at this point. They're not going to wade into the morass of legal and re- regulatory issues with crypto without being pretty convinced that it's an important thing and, and being pretty convinced of the trajectory, I think. So I, I think that from a purely symbolic standpoint, it's actually fairly meaningful and, and certainly uh, represents a, a, a yet another sign in, in sort of shifting uh, of phases and cycles. I think in terms of USDC specifically, 
it just makes a lot of sense that they would come back in the this is what stable coins are for right uh i think it just is is a very logical first place to be now i have no idea if they plan to add other assets they might never add them but it still gives this incredibly significant you know uh payment rail access to uh or, or you know an on road into the crypto space reinforces the idea that stable coins have undoubtedly been the killer app for crypto outside of Bitcoin itself, and that attempting to fit Bitcoin into every one of these use cases just has not been A, popular, and B, yep. to your point, technologically possible. I mean, we obviously saw Tesla start to sell Teslas in Bitcoin. Nobody even did it. As big of news as it was, there was no real interest in doing that. And I would have to imagine there's no real interest in using Bitcoin, at least on layer one, as a payment system. And to your point, Collison, the CEO of President of Stripe said, crypto is finding real utility with transaction speeds increasing and costs coming down. We're seeing crypto finally making sense as a means of exchange. He's talking about stable coins being a means of exchange, but this is just saying that this is the way that this works for crypto. And anecdotally, we've seen this with USDT on Tron everywhere else in the world. Right. Yep. This is the thing that people are adopting in crypto when they actually need to move money around. Yep. No, absolutely. And I guess the the one other thing just to 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 really put a fine point on how big Stripe is. Stripe is at this point the absolute default option for if you're setting up a new business and, and trying to accept payments. I mean, it's it's not even close at this point. It's it's just sort of the you know, you're going to use Stripe. So much so that I I actually saw a tweet uh, a couple days ago from a guy named Ben Tossel, who was a, a multi, multi-time founder. He runs a, a AI newsletter called Ben's Bytes now. And he said something to the effect of, turns out we were all just building Stripe wrappers as startup. And I think that that's kind of a, a fairly accurate representation of, of the world of, uh, of technology startups right now. I don't think it's particularly shocking, but it is worth noting that they're not going to be working with Tether, right? And that this is USDC exclusive. And I think it lends more credence to the idea that USDC is going to be the anointed regulatory approved stablecoin yep. in the United States. And that's worth watching, which leads perfectly into the second story we're covering today, which obviously has to be the stablecoin bill. We even have Maxine Waters now uh, citing conversations with Patrick Henry, Schumer, and Brown saying that they're getting very close on stablecoin bill. We know that Lummis and Gillibrand, after uh, coming out heavily a couple of years ago in the summer, now reproposing some stablecoin action, some legislation surrounding stablecoins. But interestingly, it uh, bans unbacked algorithmic stablecoins. Not a surprise after the Luna collapse. But it also is going to, if you dig in, it is going to effectively ban Tether in the United States. So this is a really big deal. This is, as you read through all of these articles, how it can be a huge disaster. Here's the thread. I'm just kind of cooking through all these things. You start to realize that this, once again, is backing the banks. It's allowing stable coins, but only from banks in the United States. It's going to eliminate Tether completely and is going to let the biggest players on Wall Street likely into this space. Yeah, although it's interesting. So so that is the substance of the the Lummis Gillibrand version of this for sure. Um which is interesting because they they're uh th this bill from them is a lot is being a lot less uh positively uh you know accepted than than the last time they were here. I think to your point there are some obvious differences, you know, the the fact that Luna has happened since then that was probably always going to happen even if it, you know, the dragnet caught die as it were. Um you know, the tether thing also I think Tether has given some indications over the past year or so that they are trying to be more U.S. compliant, U.S. facing, but they certainly haven't gone all the way to, you know, throwing themselves headlong to try to compete for that anointed U.S., you know, uh, stablecoin slot. I think that they, you know, want to be in a position to potentially take advantage of changes, but still are kind of thinking of themselves as the world's U.S. stablecoin, right? I think that the biggest challenge here, if we adopted something like the Lummis Gillibrand version of this, would be for Circle. There are serious questions around whether Circle would be able to operate, whether they would be able to even get the type of licenses that they needed. Um, so there, there's big questions there. However, you know, as as Waters and McHenry are talking about their version being closer, um, that is a totally separate process from whatever Lummis and Gillibrand introduced. And totally that bill, from what we know, doesn't seem to have the same sort of 
uh, challenges potentially for for Circle, at least not not a priority in the same way. Um, it's it has seemed like the biggest hang up for that bill has been questions about uh, state authority versus federal authority when it comes to who has oversight of these things. And it seemed like there has been an obvious compromise sort of sitting there, which is let states do it, but give give the Fed ultimate authority. Uh, and, and it may be that just the last mile has actually been more hung up on, um, you know, the 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 horse trading for the legislation that, you know, Senator Sherrod Brown wants in order to, uh, to to move things forward, which, by the way, you know, he's not necessarily a friend of crypto, but I think his marijuana uh, bill is one that most, you know, libertarian leaning crypto people would be very happy to pass as well. It's a uh, it's pretty coherent, let's say, with the with the rest of this. Yeah, and it makes sense now when you describe it in that manner why this would be touted collectively with marijuana legislation because many people have pointed to crypto legislation as somewhat following the same path where mm -hmm. it could be legal in a state but not federally and how do you then bank your profits and what do you do with all the cash? They really are following a similar trajectory. So it would be interesting to see two of these things get some clarity at the same time. And this is coming from committee in Congress rather than two senators proposing it to the Senate. So yep. it's a different path, but potentially to the same place. But your point is really, really necessary that these are not the same bill. And yep. we actually may want to cheer for the one coming out of Congress and not the one coming out of the Senate at this point. Yep. I think I think in a lot of ways, uh, Senators Lummis and Gillibrand have viewed their role as not to force their particular legislation down the throats of their fellow senators and their fellow representatives, but instead to make sure there is always some coherent version, some approach that looks like it would pass muster with a sensible person who's a representative who doesn't care that much about crypto. And it could be that the timing of introducing this bill was actually an attempt to catalyze the finishing of that other process more than them wanting to just you know have their names on stuff. They're really very unlike the type of uh, of senators who just want their name on everything. They're they're almost the opposite so far from what I've seen. And they're diametrically opposed on most policy. Yep. <laughs> You're talking about a Wyoming Republican senator and a New York State Democrat. Yep. So uh, unlikely bedfellows for, for sure. And just I just wanted to bring up the one last article, Tether Stablecoin Dominance, May Wayne following proposed U.S. rule, basically saying that any issuer that doesn't have a banking license would be capped at $10 billion, which we know just effectively kneecaps uh, tether entirely. The irony that uh, Tether has effectively helped, you know, hyper dollarization by buying treasuries should not be lost if they get kicked out of the United States and their business model remains buying U.S. treasuries. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> Tether is a really confounding force for the for the U.S. government. It is a I mean, it is the inheritor of the entire euro dollar system, which is a thing that has been both good for the U.S. in many ways in terms of keeping the, the dollar, the dominant currency in the world, but also completely outside of our control in ways that are very uncomfortable. You know, it, it, the euro dollar system makes monetary policy less effective because we can't really control the supply of dollars in the world. And now, you know, over the next call it decade, we're going to face these other interesting choices of how much to let Tether be versus try to not let them be versus try to actually institutionalize them in some way. And I think that your point that they are at this point, one of the biggest buyers of U.S. treasuries in the world is not going to be lost on people either. So it's, it's pretty fascinating to watch from a from a geopolitical standpoint. Yeah, especially when the foreign banks that used to stack treasuries are now stacking gold, sending the prices of that flying. There's just so mm -hmm. much nuance and really interesting stories. I also don't know if you saw that Howard Lutnick, the CEO of Cantor Fitzgerald, who effectively now has said, we custody Tether's assets, they're good to go. We saw that in the past, who over the weeks has said that Tether is essential for United States dominance and dollar dominance. He said, I believe yesterday, that Americans don't need Tether. <laughs> he's, he's a huge Tether cheerleader, but said, hey, you got cash in your pocket. Why would you need a stable coin in the United States? And in the same article, I believe it said that Tether is still the bulk of Tether is onshore in the United States. So just a hell of a lot going on here uh, with stable coins. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. Hello, breakers. Today's episode is sponsored by Ledger. As another cycle ramps up, it's another chance to think about your Bitcoin custody best practices. And of course, to help all the new folks do the same. Ledger is the global platform for securing Bitcoin and other crypto. Ledger combines both hardware wallets and the Ledger Live app 
to offer the best way to buy, sell, swap, and stake without sacrificing on security or self-custody. Ledger features cutting-edge technology in the form of a certified secure chip and a proprietary operating system, but also brings ease of use. This makes Ledger a safe and secure way to manage your digital assets without all the stress. Check out the link to the Bitcoin Ledger Nano in the show notes. 5% of all sales of the Bitcoin Ledger Nano go to support Bitcoin development. Thanks once again to Ledger for supporting the breakdown. All right, breakers. Consensus 2024 marks the 10th gathering of the biggest event that's devoted to all sides of the crypto, blockchain, and Web3 ecosystems. Join pioneering thinkers and builders as they delve into the future of DeFi and explore game-changing tech, from AI to ZK proofs and everything in between. The event is three days of jam-packed content, networking, and so much more. Some of the speakers at the event include Chris Dixon, the founder and managing partner at A16Z Crypto, Sergey Nazarov, the co-founder of Chainlink, Kathy Wood, the CEO of ARK, Hester Peirce, commissioner, of course, from the U.S. SEC, and Tom Emmer, Republican Majority Whip for the U.S. House of Representatives. Visit consensus2024.coindesk.com to learn more and save 15% on registration with the code BREAKDOWN. That is 15% on registration with the code BREAKDOWN. The next story has to be the ETFs because U.S. Bitcoin ETFs suffer one of their worst outflows as digital token waivers. Of course, we know that the 71-day inflow boom ended for BlackRock's IBIT. Totally normal, guys. We're talking about a historic run, one of the largest of any ETF with inflows in history. And then we obviously also have to talk about the Hong Kong ETFs that are launching for both Bitcoin and Ethereum, which seemingly when you dig in will be a drop in the bucket of flows versus uh, United States ETFs. Yep. I think that the the Hong Kong ETFs are clearly like m- more relevant as a story in terms of the continued softening of China's stance towards crypto, I, I think more than anything else. You know, if you view Hong Kong as sort of a proxy for the, the farthest edge of finance that China is willing to countenance in its sort of orbit, it is notable that these things are have been approved and, and they're trading, but they're not going to make a big difference when it comes to, you know, a- actual volume or anything like that. Um, you know, when it comes to the ETF flows, I think one of the interesting parts of the story is that the outflows have had seemingly no impact really on, on price. And the question is, does that mean that the the sort of relationship between the ETF and price for the moment is uh, is a little less close than it than it perhaps was in the past? Um, I think that there's some interesting things to look at there. But you know, to to your point there was always going to be some amount of a of a of a peeling off period and you know the the question i think of course for for the etfs is just where the next new source of demand comes from is it you know going to be when advisors get on board and start recommending it for people's portfolios is it going to be you know is there another wave of institutions that's waiting for it to drop down to 50 to buy because they've gotten their mandates approved but they don't want to get in at these levels there's all these sort of questions but the thing exists now it's going to continue to exist and uh as much as we would like it to it can't go up only forever just to put some numbers behind this, the 11 Bitcoin spot ETFs have seen 12.4 billion of positive net flow so far. Of course, that's kind of hard to calculate when you have a lot coming out of GBTC. But they expect that in a year, the Hong Kong products in total, Bitcoin and Ethereum will do about 1 billion. And that that 1 billion is 2% of the total addressable Hong Kong market, which is only 50 billion in ETFs in total. And the total market cap of spot Bitcoin ETFs in the United States is higher than that 50 billion. So yeah. our Bitcoin ETFs is larger than their entire ETF market. Yeah, it's it's wild. You know, Hong Kong is not considered a small market. Like when we think of Hong Kong, we think about it. You know, financial centers. It's it's right after London and New York. You know, but it's it's just another reminder of how massive U.S. markets are compared to just everything else in the world. Yeah, the next story here is pretty astounding. Is that CZ and Doquan under heavy, heavy attack with very, very large fines and jail sentences on the horizon, potentially, that I don't think people expected. The United States SEC looking for $5.3 billion fine uh, to Do Kwan, $4 billion of which they're claiming are ill-gotten gains. Really interesting to dig into because I'm still confused as to whether what he did was just hubris or an outright fraud and crime. And of course, CZ now, they're looking for three years in prison. He's getting support, friends, family, royalty, seeking mercy for crypto's richest man. A lot of support for CZ. Interesting to see how bipolar that is or how different from obviously what happened with SBF. Obviously, the crimes are different, but 
I can't find a single person really that thinks what CZ did was terrible. But clearly, the United States government is not playing around here. They want huge fines and huge sentences for these guys. Yeah, I mean, I think that the... I, the fines are hard for me to get all fluffed up about because it's like the numbers that they throw out at this stage in the process are are so arbitrary and they never reflect what actually happens. You know, like the, one of the big questions with the FTX estate is that the IRS is seeking like twenty five billion dollars. Like, yeah, it's like a, a, a ridiculous number. And it's like you might as well call it a million bajillion gazillion dollars. Like, you know, we're, it's not even like you want so much that we can't possibly do it. All right. That's where we're starting from the negotiations. Let's figure it out. I do think that to the extent that we view these things in total as the U.S. trying to send a strong signal, that is definitely true. You know, when it comes to CZ's sentence, it seems like he had prepared or has prepared for the reality of serving some amount of time. Uh, it, it feels like, you know, whatever his lawyers advised that, I mean, the, the deal that he cut basically said that if if his sentence was in the sentencing guidelines, he would not appeal. That was part of the agreement. And um, and you have to think that that came with a presumption that there was going to be some time served. I think the fact that there was a presumption that there was going to be some time served has to do with a move that's broader than crypto, but certainly we are at the epicenter of right now of trying to actually hold white collar crime to more account than, than we have in the past, to not let people just get off with fines and slaps on the wrist, but to actually see some amount of uh, you know punishment in, in this way. The prosecutor recommending three years, not super surprising given that they had previously, you know, as they were talking about whether CZ should be allowed to, to leave or not, said that they might recommend even more than that, you know, up to the to the absolute maximum. Ultimately, it's going to be the judge in the case that decides. I would be surprised if he went with that three-year recommendation. Uh, I think that he's going to respect the spirit, let's call it, of the plea agreement, and I think he's going to get 18 months. Yeah, I think so, too. I wouldn't even be surprised if it was less. Obviously, CZ's lawyers themselves pushing for probation. Yeah. Interestingly, there's another fine here. I, I don't now remember the number of 40, 60 more million dollars is already paid over three billion, I think. Um, just seems like they're fishing for more at the moment. And CZ has done everything he can to possibly get ahead of this. And uh, Frankly, I hope he gets less than three years. I think it would yeah. be pretty sad if he, if he did three years. And he, by the way, did the exact opposite of what SBF did at his own sentencing hearing, SBF obviously tried to cope his way through it, admitting really no fault, acting like he didn't ha know what was going on. CZ wrote a very heartfelt letter apologizing for all of this, saying, I would never do uh, anything like this. This is the only time I'm ever going to be on the other side of a, of a criminal investigation. And, you know, this was never my intention. So they're just very vastly different characters. Yeah, 100%. I, I also think that there's a big space I think in the crypto industry for people who think the laws are stupid, but still comply. And then there's people who think the laws are stupid and and try to get away with sort of skirting around them. And then there's people who think the laws literally don't, don't apply. apply to them <laughs> and uh, and are just going to ignore the existence of law as a principle for human society. And it turns out that last one ends up in jail for a lot longer. Yeah, I thought he'd be there a lot longer. But uh, speaking of crime, whether it is or not, founders and CEO of cryptocurrency mixing service arrested and charged with money laundering and unlicensed money transmitting offenses. This is Samurai Wallet. And they're saying $2 billion in unlawful transactions and laundering over $100 million. This, of course, coming from one of our uh, main enemies at this point, Damien Williams, the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York. And as I kind of alluded to at the beginning, we're getting the Southern District of New York. We're getting some wild, wild uh, FBI letters going out here for anybody who didn't see this. Warning Americans against using cryptocurrency money transmitting services. Basically, don't use a private wallet. <laughs> don't self-custody is what this looks like if you read in. And the IRS set to kill pseudonymity in crypto. Tax form proposal raises alarms. I mean, this is all happening effectively in a week. And we haven't even gotten to the SEC, which will go next with consensus and Ethereum. But what do you make? Do you think this is coordinated, coincidental? Do you think self-custody is going to exist in the United States? What's happening here? Man, there's a lot. I, I feel like this is uh, the Samurai Wallet guys are like the Tom Hardy meme where he says that's bait. Like these guys are like, you know, plants to attract the uh, <laughs> regulators and, and authorities uh, with, with how they behave. I, I mean, this is a great example of... Um, a situation where you kind of have to unpack 
the issues underlying it from the the particular uh, you know culprits or defendants in this case. You know, samurai did a lot of things from a. a I mean, they they literally taunted you know the the US authorities in numerous ways in numerous public statements they talked about inviting russian oligarchs onto the system with it, which whether tongue in cheek or not like come on guys right and so they are very let's call them unsympathetic actors in a lot of ways and i think that many in the crypto industry have pointed out that it would be better for us if we didn't have so many unsympathetic actors that make for great targets however at the end of the day that's not actually the big part of this the big part is the underlying questions of privacy technology of whether you're on the hook for code and specifically i think in this case it's a little bit nuanced but what really constitutes a money transmitting business right there was 2019 fincen guidance that basically made it seem or at least the way that the crypto industry took that guidance was that if you were not custodying uh, assets. If you were not custodying your customers' assets, you were not a money transmitting business. That's been the basis for how a lot of companies have run themselves since that happened. It seems that the arguments that we're seeing now do not require, or, or at least the, the government is trying to argue that it doesn't require actual custody of those assets for there to be a centralized money transmitting entity. And that's sort of the big change that I think people need to keep an eye on because there's much bigger implications, which of course gets us to this the, the broader story even than that, which is the push against self-hosted anything. I think that it's, it is really clear that, um, I don't know, I, I'm not quite ready to call it this, but it sort of feels like Part 2.0 of Operation Choke Point 2.0, where the big battle in general to debank crypto hasn't worked. The hope that it just goes away because it dies didn't work. And so instead, we've gone back to this one very specific thing, which is endemic and very essential to what makes crypto crypto, which is self-custody. And uh, there seems to be a broad scale attempt to just outlaw and ban that. Basically, it seems like the US wants uh, the, the reality to be that you can never interact with money without a third party intermediary being there to, to tell the government who you are and what you're doing. And there are, of course, bigger implications than just crypto, but it is very central to, uh, to the crypto industry to, for, for, for that to be happening. Yeah, well, if you take a look at what's happening with the IRS here, I don't think crypto will be pseudo-anonymous or privacy-preserving anymore, at least in the U.S. Yesterday, the IRS issued the long-awaited draft form 1099-DA, the first tax form specifically designed to collect your ID and detailed transaction data at scale from brokers. Brokers, CFI exchanges, certain DeFi exchanges, and wallets will be required to generate this form for each sale transaction and submit that info to the IRS and you, similar to stockbrokers, starting 1-1-2025. This is literally impossible. Yeah. I don't know, man. I, uh, I, obviously there's a lot of legal battles ahead. Uh, you know, the, it is very, it seems very unlikely to me that these are, uh, particularly winnable. I think that obviously there's some amount of, um, uh, of fight to be had here and there's broader privacy issues, but I don't know. I'm, I'm not particularly, uh, bullish on our chances when it comes to this stuff. Cash is already a grind on them when it comes to uh, invisibility. I don't think that they're going to allow anything to be even remotely invisible. And I think that by trying to sort of make things that obviously can't be uh, KYC, like these sort of self-hosted wallets, you know, they're they're positioning themselves for a compromise peelback that effectively gets everything else, you know, and and changes yeah. fundamentally the way that people interact with with crypto here. If you want to own Bitcoin in the United States, you will own a BlackRock ETF and you will like it, sir. <laughs> Basically, or, or, and, it, and may, maybe the one the one exception that we can hope for is you. there's a special privilege to put your own Bitcoin or crypto on your ledger, but that's it. You know, you can't interact with it from there. You can't do anything with it. And there's probably right. some gateway through which you have to do that. So the U.S. government has a record of when it went into your, you know what I mean? Like it's it's that's the direction that things are headed. Uh, yeah, good old uh, capitalism and freedom in it. We should we should have saved Stripe for after this. <laughs> oh, seriously, well, final story, which is the biggest. Uh, consensus files lawsuit against SEC and commissioners over ether regulation. The industry once again going on the offensive against the SEC, but interestingly, at the same time as they're receiving a Wells notice from the SEC saying that the SEC is coming for them, but maybe. 
the Ethereum Foundation consensus trying to get ahead of this uh, and looking to force clarity on whether Ethereum is, in fact, a security or a commodity. Yeah, this is uh, this is wild. Yeah, I listen. So I, I don't think that it particularly matters that it's sort of prompted or at least initial, like you know, fi finally catalyzed by that Wells notice. I think that was coming down the pipe. I think that they thought it was coming down the pipe. That was just sort of the next step in the process. You, you don't file an uh, you know a, a lawsuit like this days after getting something like that. This has been in the works for a while, uh, obviously, right? Um, I'm actually much more bullish on the crypto industry's ability to fight the SEC and th these types of battles than I am on sort of the very core money transmitting business sort of, you know, national security type arguments where, uh, you know, you're not even battling with someone, you're battling with the entire establishment all at once. You know, uh, listen, the, the SEC has picked a lot of fights on a lot of fronts. I continue to think that a big part of their objective is just gumming up the works by Slow having down. us all uh, all in fights to try to delegitimate it in the eyes of Wall Street who are now coming there. I mean, there's been a clear shift in regulatory policy towards this, you know, if you're not losing cases, you're not fighting hard enough cases kind of thinking. And, and you know, Gensler brags always about how many enforcement actions the SEC has brought as his record of, of being good, right? It is very clear that for the powers that be that surround Gensler, uh, enforcement actions is his metric. That's what he's being graded upon. And yeah. so, you know, if that's the case, if it's not winning, you know, necessarily enforcement actions, it's taking on tough ones, just, you know, sue everyone and let it, let it all sort out later. Yeah. He won't be there when any of these are resolved anyways. Yep. Regardless, it, regardless of what happens, no SEC chairman lasts that long. Yep. The good news is, though, I think that they're a pain in the ass in the short and medium term, but they're much more likely to result in definitive answers that can allow us to move forward in positive ways. As we've seen with the Ripple decision to ETF pipeline, I think that we're likely to see other things like that. You know, I think that it is very likely to me that this sort of Ethereum case goes more in our favor than in, than in their favor uh, when it comes to this. But, you know, we'll see. It's still going to be a, a multi-year process for that to happen. That was our last story. We had honorable mentions, which we won't dig deeply into, but I know we have PC data coming today and inflation has been uh, a hot story this week and what's going to likely happen with the Fed. And of course, the other, I think, is the Biden proposal to raise cap gains to 44.6% and potentially 25% on unrealized capital gains. These things will never pass, but in my mind, the very fact that we have to spend our breath on them is just astounding. My favorite meme that I saw was the one of sort of like the spirit rising up above the body. And the caption is the, you know, Wall Streeters, the Demo feeling the Democrat leave their body as they read about 25% unrealized gains tax. I and mean, for I, people who don't understand what that means, I mean, imagine a founder's stock value goes up $100 million in a year. They have to literally pay $25 million in taxes that year. And the day later, it could go back down to its previous value. Oh, and the other irony is that there's, unrealized gain would have to come from them realizing a gain selling 25 million dollars worth of the stock just to be able to make the payment it's i mean the whole thing is so absurd and it's in, a, insane and the 44.6 percent all that's going to do is make the billionaires who can never sell anything so there'll be no taxable income they'll take larger loans and by the way the interest on those loans tax-free yeah. I mean, listen, this is an election year policy. This is a, you know, you want to be able to say you're going after the billionaires, the rich billionaires who can afford to pay more. It's just positioning. It'll go away after November. Uh, I, yeah. Like I said, it's not going to happen. It's just populism. On it is wild though. in different forms. Yeah. It's just wild. I didn't even intend to talk about it. that's all we got guys. You should be obviously listening to the breakdown every single day and LW checking out all of his channels and following him on X, formerly known as Twitter. I still just can't say X. It's just yeah. up there. Yeah, I do a lot uh, of Twitter, Twitter, Twitter you. slash X. Yeah, and hopefully we'll be on a better run of you and I not being out of town for a while here. We can make uh, make this more consistent again. I know a lot of people love it. I actually ran into someone in Dubai who tracked me down just to compliment you. I love um, it. <laughs> he was like, I love your Friday show. That guy's so smart. I was like, Am I <laughs> smart? No, too but uh, yeah, it, it really happened. So there are people who specifically watch only for this show, which was interesting to find, I think, uh, from someone randomly in Dubai who wasn't an American. Guys, that's all we got for you today. We will see you next week. Peace.